Thanks for checking out this movie review video. So this is for the 1971 Italian giallo film Slaughter Hotel. And it's not a great title, but this movie sucks. It was such a great title, but the movie sucks. But I guess I should have kind of expected it based off of one of its alternate titles, which is Asylum Erotica. Uh, that kind of gives you more of an idea of what this film is. I feel like Slaughter Hotel really sells it more as like a straight horror. It's going to be a good, fun kill filled giallo film which there are some kind of fun kills in this but um asylum erotica gets more to what it really is about which is all about the nudity all about the female on female action and all about the masturbation female masturbation that they show straight on um it's porn i mean it's basically porn now there's a time in my life where i would have been like oh man this is awesome but at this time in my life it's more like oh man i just really wasted like an hour and a half of my time. I think it was actually like an hour and 36 minutes, something like that. But this film is way too long and does not have nearly enough story for how long it is. Uh, geez. Anyway, this one is done by, directed by Fernando DeLeo, which is the very first time I've seen a Fernando DeLeo film. Might be the last. We'll see. Uh, he did some other films such as A Wrong Way to Love, Naked Violence, which those two titles give you an idea of what he's all about, The Italian Connection, Madness, and The Violent Breed. Also written by DeLeo as well as Nino, Nino Latino. I'm going to guess that's a pseudonym because I don't think anyone actually is named Nino Latino. Very odd name. He wrote scripts for A Wrong Way to Love and Naked Violence. So once again, you see what types of films they're into. Obviously worked with DeLeo before. Porn buddies, kind of. Yeah. So this stars the notoriously difficult Klaus Kinski. Very distinct look to this actor. I actually haven't seen him in a lot. I just know that he's kind of, <clears throat> excuse me, notoriously tough to deal with. Um, I thought he did a good job acting wise. I know he's always been considered to be a very good actor. He's got a very interesting look that I think helps with his, with his, you know, overall air of acting in any role, especially a role where you're kind of supposed to suspect him as a potential killer. Uh, I do think they, you know, cast that character well, Dr. Clay, Dr. Clay, um, because, you know, you look at him and he looks evil. He looks like he's probably up to no good. He looks like he could very well end up being the murderer. And at one point in the film, they even do a shot kind of from behind during the, I'll talk about it later more, but the crossbow uh, from outside uh, shot, they shoot him from behind and you see the hair, like the long kind of blondish hair. That was set up to kind of put your attention onto Dr. Clay at that point, because obviously at that point, Cheryl's husband, who's the real killer, wasn't really around. He was just show, showing up early in the very beginning so that they could basically be like, see, you saw the killer before and then forget about him because he hasn't been there in quite some time. Although this whole film, I think I might just forget about. This film not only is also known as Asylum Erotica, but it's also known as Cold-Blooded Beast, also very misleading. Asylum Erotica, it should just be called Asylum Erotica because literally that is a much better representation of what the film is about. So a dude slowly lurking in the dark is a solid way to hook an audience early in this film. I did like that. It gave me hope for the film. Initially, I was like, here we go. This looks fun. Because it's a cool premise, too. Like, the fact that it's a rest facility, which is basically a mental institute for people who don't want to feel like they need mental health help. Uh, that's... Those, that, those were actually things. They kind of frame those things as kind of like a, it's like a weekend, maybe week, maybe month, maybe multiple months, maybe years getaway so that you can, you know, just have a break, get less stressed, and then when you come back, you'll be the same person. You won't have your nymphomania, you won't have your homicidal tendencies, you know, normal stuff. <laughs> uh, so yeah. That, that's kind of how that goes. But uh, great setting. I love the setting of it. I love the potential of what they set up with this film, especially how it starts with this guy just like lurking into this, what looks like a castle, like the facility looks like a castle. And that's the thing, like a lot of things about it look really good. Uh, directed pretty well, cinematography is pretty good. I especially like their, uh, they did a lot of like long shots, 
that I really enjoy that kind of like really opens up the set, really lets, gives room to the characters to kind of like move around and experience it. But it also gives the audience more time to really look at all the intricacies of the set design and just kind of feel a little bit more like you're in the film, in the moment. But don't really think you need it for this film, but it looked good to start. It really got me hopeful. And then it just... Uh, when you see the Iron Maiden in the beginning, you think, please, please, please let this be used for one of the kills. And it was used for one of the kills, so I was happy about that. But then you actually get to the killing portion with the Iron Maiden, and it wasn't that well done. I feel like they needed to add more gore to it, more blood, more of the guy who got killed really reacting to it more or being more, you know, panicked about this is going to happen. Um, better when it, it eventually is opened up and you see kind of like the wounds in his back and all the blood there, but still not the greatest. Um, I'll talk about that guy a little bit later because odd. Um, the rapid cuts between the front and back of the shadowy figure going up the stairs in the beginning, horrible. Don't know who thought that was a good idea, but yeah, like he's literally like shadowy figure walking up the stairs, going to look to kill somebody. And they're literally doing the shot where it's like front, back front, back, front, back. And it's like, why? Is it supposed to be kind of like this visual thing to like put you on edge? I don't know. But it looks terrible. It takes you out of the film because it makes you like, what are they doing right now? What is the purpose of this? It looks awful. So yeah, it's just one of those moments. They make a real point of showing Nurse Helen's eyes. They're beautiful, creepy, and haunting all at the same time. And it made me think that she could have ended up being the killer very early on because the focus so much on like the color of her eyes and how they look. Uh, but then again, maybe that was there as a way to give you that feeling of her being kind of creepy, her looking kind of haunting but beautiful at the same time as a way to kind of be another red herring, to be like, look, she kind of looks like she could be a killer. Let's focus here. Don't look at Cheryl's husband. Barely pay attention to him because he's barely in it. Ruth having homicidal tendencies is obviously a large red herring that's thrown into this film. Yet another one where they make sure that they talk about it. Not only do they make sure they talk about it, but they show it numerous times where she's thinking about killing or the time when she almost uh, you know, runs the car that her husband's driving off the road on their way there. And then she has a knife at another point and it's just like, okay. But then this brings up another thing, which I was going to talk about later, but I was talking about it now while I'm talking about Ruth and her homicidal tendencies. Why, 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 if you treat people with homicidal tendencies at your arrest facility, why would you have all these very sharp, very able to be used for murder weapons just hanging out in the facility? With someone like Ruth, who you know is, has homicidal tendencies, why would you make available to her a myriad things with which to kill people. Doesn't make any sense. But that's Giallo for you. Well, I mean, I don't even know if I would really consider it. I mean, this is technically Giallo, but for me, I'm kind of not really considering it Giallo. This is like one of, this I this is in my bottom. Like, this is, this is the bottom. Prior to this, it was the uh, Pajama Girl case, because that is awful. But this is even worse, in my opinion, which is really bad. You know, if you say something's worse than the Pajama Girl case, that's bad. That's bad. Anne is a sex maniac. Isn't that who they usually say is the killer in Giallo films? I thought that was kind of funny. That dawned on me. Because all the time, when the murders start happening, they're like, it's a sex maniac. It's a sex maniac. They don't say that in this film, especially because the inspectors aren't that involved at all until the very end when they just start pointing fingers and accusing everyone of covering things up, which is weird. But, um... It, it was just, it seemed like maybe kind of a funny nod to that's what they do in Giallo of just being like, oh, it's a sex maniac as a way to plant yet another red herring to be like, she's a sex maniac. And they usually say sex maniacs are the killers. So maybe she's the killer. So I just thought that was funny. But we all know the, the sex maniac aspect of it for Anne, as well as Mara, it seemed, as well as Helen seems to be, uh, as well as Cheryl, actually, everyone's a sex maniac. That's all in there just to get more of the erotica going. What an excessive shower scene with Anne. This film is riddled with excessive scenes usually having to do with nudity. 
the shower scene, the bath scene, the massage scene, the dance scene. Those are the big nudity-laden, sex indu uh, sexuality-inducing scenes that are way, 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 way too long. <laughs> and it kills the film. Like, the pacing is garbage with this film. And that's one of the biggest reasons, is they focus so much on the actual sex when they could have focused... They could have had as much nudity in this film. Really, they could have. But had a good film because they focus more on the story and more on the killings and stuff like that. Just saying. Messed up priorities. So, are we going to get any story or will it just be pointless nude scenes? Just answer my own question. Yes, pointless nude scenes, pretty much. Ah, the old boning the gardener bit. That is an old bit. But it turned pretty sour after the sex because of all the slapping. That was one of those things. And this happens in Giallo all the time where, like, the, it turns on a dime. It's just like, everything's going great. We just had sex. We're, we're really digging each other. The pheromone, you know, the adrenaline's pumping. The pheromones are going... And then the gardener's just like, hey, you need to get out of here. Oh, wait, you're not listening? Whack, 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 whack. I mean, it happens in Giallo all the time. They do it all the time. So much so that in the uh, Giallo homage slash parody film, The Editor, which is a lot of fun if you're big into Giallo, they make fun of that aspect. Like, there's literally a line in it where they're like, could you imagine that, a man slapping another man? But there's a lot of slapping in it, too, because they're making fun of that aspect. Because there's always slapping. Women are always getting slapped in Giallo films. It's crazy. Not only is the scene of Anne kissing all over the orderlies weird, but it goes on way, 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 way too long. That's another one. Like, that was after she just got slapped and she left the gardener. She's just, like, throwing herself all over these orderlies and trying to kiss them and stuff. Like, fine, you can have that scene. I get it. But just a few seconds, man. Like, it, it felt like it went on for, like, a solid minute. And there's nothing there. Like, there's no story being moved forward. There's nothing going on for her character that makes any sense or matters. And it's just like, oh, God. Ruth's dream sequence is overkill. G dream sequences in general and the frequency of dream sequences in this film, especially because they mean nothing story-wise, they're excessive. There's too much. Way too much with the dream sequences. Way too long. Another issue. Terrible. That strangling scene, terrible. And everything leading up to it takes way too long. That's another one that was with the killer going to her, uh, going to Ruth and giving her the knife, which I don't understand why he gave her the knife and then he takes it away from her because she was going to stab him. Like, that made no sense. And the fact that he just, like, hangs out and breathes in a weird way and then starts strangling her in the most odd strangling way I've ever seen in my life. Like, very inefficient killer. I don't understand that at all, but terrible scene. Who is this dude going around at night finishing everyone's drinks? Unbelievably random. Yes, the guy who ends up getting killed with the Iron Maiden. Which, side note, he actually has a name in the IMDb credits. He was Augusto. It didn't matter. He literally, that was the only point that he was in the film. Nobody knows who he is. He just randomly shows up, starts going through this place at night, and just drinking all the leftover alcoholic beverages that are around, and then he gets killed. It's crazy that he doesn't have a name. Yet, Cheryl's husband has no name in the IMDb credits except Cheryl's husband. Go figure. It, it So much of this doesn't make sense. But I did find it funny. Like, it was some nice comic relief that there's this random dude shows up and he's just, like, downing the rest of people's drinks. Something. Uh, oh, I already covered the... Uh, with people with homicidal tendencies around, why would you have all these sharp weapons? Yeah. How freaking long do we have to watch this bathing scene with Mara and Helen? Yeah, it's pretty bad. I mean, at least, like... I understand some of the scenes because, like, oh, you know, it's very... The very first uh, nude scene with Anne in the, in the shower, like, okay, I understand... It's surely for sex appeal, which I know that's what the bathing scene was for also, but, like, it's not sexually interesting. I mean, maybe to someone, but I'm saying, like, when you compare it to, like, the shower scene, you compare it to the massage scene, it's not interesting. And then after that, the dancing scene that comes right after the bathing scene, even less interesting. Well, actually, no, it's a little bit more interesting than the bathing scene, but still, like, why are we doing this? It's just another one of those scenes that's thrown in there that you're literally, like, we could be doing anything else in this film right now, and it would be much better. 
let's go back to the dude who's just finishing drinks. Like, if this film had a whole half an hour of this dude going through the entire facility just finishing all the booze, that would be more entertaining, I think. Ugh. By the time we get to Anne's dream sequence, I've really had it with these. They're pointless and too drawn out. I kind of already talked about that. And Anne gets killed, and then we go back to Mara and her bath? Come on now. Then the excessive dance scene. Yeah, it was literally one of those things, and then I'll stop talking about the bath and dance scenes. But it literally, like, the bath scene went on too long, and I was just like, oh my god, finally we're done with that, because you go to the, the dream sequence. And then you go back to the bath scene. It's like, you, we didn't get enough of this? Ugh. I did like the crossbow bolt to Mara's neck, though. That was awesome. That's what I referenced before, where they're kind of from behind trying to make it look like Dr. Clay. Uh, but, I mean, that guy's accuracy is amazing, because he, like, shoots, I think it was, like, second story. He was pretty far back, too. Gets the crossbow bolt right through her neck as she's, for no reason, randomly just standing there with the window open at night. Of course. Uh, but it looked good, like, with the arrow sticking through and everything. I like that. The bolt. It was pretty good. I like how Dr. Osterman doesn't seem at all concerned that Mara was killed at that point. Yeah, he seems way too calm. Like, maybe this happens a lot at this place. I don't know. But it is very ridiculous. I guess showing the killer just swinging the sword around in the basement is supposed to show his level of craziness? I don't know. Was that what it was supposed to be? I don't know. It's, um... There's a lot of for no reasons. Like, literally, they're showing the killer in the basement just swinging a sword around. Just... Ugh. So Cheryl's husband killed a bunch of women to cover up that he was going to kill his wife. Couldn't he just off her in some remote place instead of where it's crawling with freaking people who could catch him, who could see him, who could investigate things... It doesn't make sense at all. Like, the rationale behind it, obviously he's a crazy person because he wants to kill people, but the rationale behind the script writing for this is awful. Like, he's literally like, man, I, I really need to get rid of my wife. What's the best way to do it? Well, I think I need lots of people around so that they can be witnesses. No. Like, I, I get the point of... He was trying to cover it up. Like, he was killing the other women so that it would look like there's some sort of killer on the loose. And then, oh, obviously, Cheryl also gets killed because there's this killer on the loose. But you, there's so much more risk. As opposed to just, hey, why don't you guys, like, go take a drive to a, a, one of the beautiful cliffs that they have in Italy and just push her off the thing. Say that she slipped. Much better. You would have had less chance of getting caught. Come on, man. Why did he keep killing instead of escaping? That's another thing that makes absolutely no sense. He knew that they were onto him. They knew that they saw his face. They He knew that they knew who he was and they were after him in the building. But instead of trying to escape, trying to get away with this, which I assume he initially thought, this is my entire plan so that I can get away with it, not so that I can be caught and people would think, oh, that was cool. But... It, you would think he's trying to get away, but he's being chased and he's just like, nah, I think I'm just going to kill some more and then I'll die. I mean, it, that is a, a decent scene though when he goes in and he's like swinging that flail around or, or that mace on the chain around and just like killing all the women and then he gets all shot up. Like, good scene, so I understand why they put it in the film for that reason, but that guy would try to get away and it's just ridiculous. <sighs> I already talked about the thing I did like with the long shots. Um, so, you know, cinematography, directing-wise, pretty solid. Heavy on nudity and light on story, and the setting has a lot of potential, so it really sucks that they squandered this one. I think someone should remake this. Someone do a remake of Slaughter Hotel, because we don't need remakes of good films. We need remakes of terrible films like this that have a great premise set up, a great location set up, and they just all over it. So someone l write the Slaughter Hotel remake. I watch it. it it's got. I mean, by default, it's going to be better. It's going to be better. Like 
you have to try to write a script this bad. I'm just saying. And the pacing is just the worst with this film. Like, I was, like, getting very bored during this film numerous times. So, yeah. So, um, ooh. Well, I was trying to think, is this one that I can rate two ways? Can I rate it just as a straight-up film and as a So Bad It's Good? And I think I will do that because there is a little more value to it as a So Bad It's Good. So, as an actual film with, you know, out of five stars with half stars in play, I'm going to go a one star. Now, I was considering half star, but because of the the good directing and cinematography and I think Klaus Kinski, a lot of the actors did a, did a solid job, you know, and there were some decent-ish kills in there. I'm going to give it one star. It's still not great. But as a So Bad It's Good film, two stars. Yeah, so. But I'd love to hear other people's opinions on this, especially if you like this film. Especially if you love this film. Tell it. Tell me why. And not just because of nudity. Give me give me some other reasons. So go ahead and put your comments down there. We can talk about this or just other Giallo if you're just over Slaughter Hotel like I am. Uh, also, do me a quick favor. Hit subscribe. Takes you a second. Costs you nothing. Totally painless. And it really helps me out. I just suffered through Slaughter Hotel. Just give me the subscribe for that. I mean, please. Uh <laughs> No, but that's a way to kind of, you know, help build this nerdy horror community that I'm building, and it really does keep me motivated. So, uh, also hit the notification bell button if you would like, because then you can know when I'm putting up new videos, which I'm usually doing four, maybe more sometimes, uh, each week. Although, when we get to October, I'll be doing a video every day, so you can look for that. But anyway, thanks for checking this out. Thanks for taking your time to watch Slaughter Hotel with me. And until next time, keep it brutal.